Lord. If you have your Bible this morning, Matthew chapter number 12, <clears throat> we'll begin there, Matthew chapter 12. Thank you for singing and thank you for uh, being here. I tell you, I uh, had an a interesting and a full week, and boy, last night I had some fellowship over at uh, the Lamb's house and appreciate all the folks that helped and came and, and put those things on. Uh, kids had a good time. Talked to one little girl. She came. I said, did you have a good time last night? She said, my whole body's sore. I'm like, oh, that's a good night. That's a good night. Matthew chapter 12, verse number 43. <clears throat> we'll look at this, this morning. Matthew 12, verse 43. The Bible says, when uh, the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return unto my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Let's be seated. We'll bow to pray together. Father, Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for your will that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. Thank you for um, the place that we can meet and uh, hear from the, the word you preserved and provided. And then, God, I pray for wisdom to deliver it. I surely need that. I, I lack it on my own account. And then I thank you for your grace, your goodness. And boy, I just, just uh, don't want to ever um, take for granted uh, the salvation that you provided and the spirit that lives within me. I pray that you would forgive us of our faults and failures um, individually and collectively as a church. Lord, we're not perfect, but we're grateful we have a perfect Savior. Yeah. Pray that you bless the, the services and all the things going on around the building this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, wow. <clears throat> Just an introduction. I want to uh, give you some words and, and uh, think about what, what these mean to us. Rehabilitation. Reformation. Reshaping, remaking, renew, restore, replenish, recover, refresh, refill, return, repent. All those words have in this idea of doing it again, doing it again, doing it again. And, and all of those words in some parts of our life are, are very needed. Uh, I need to be renewed from time to time. My purpose and my, my vision, I need to repent. Uh, definitely from time to time, and re, uh, uh, recall my, my need of, of being clean in front of God, and I've repented, and then I've repented again. Um, when we talk about repentance for salvation, though, that's a, a one, one sacrifice for sin forever the Lord provided, and, and we are, are uh, covered by that payment when we accept Him as our Savior. And that word rehabilitate, um, I... I have learned uh, some things about that and recidivism rates, and I'm just looking at some t statistics, and the state of Ohio just put out a report that they've followed uh, uh, folks who were in prison for three years, and about 20-some percent have uh, uh, re-offended re and, and, and back in prison, but that's just after three years. A 10-year study shows that 82 percent of state prisoners are arrested again. 62% return back to prison. And the questions arise, is there really rehabilitation? Well, this passage of Scripture uh, gives, gives some talk to that. And, and I, know, I know that I've, I've heard this and I've said it before. We say things like this. Man, if they would only stop doing this. Man, if they would just get away from that. Oh, if only they could clean up their act, or if only they could stop being around, and you name it, and you, you uh, list it, and uh, we uh, uh, just, just uh, I don't know, out of, out of um, expectation, uh, suppose that when someone gets a church and religion that, that their life is going to be changed, and I think that's a great expectation. But I want to remind us that the sometimes... We are focused on the change down here, and remember, good works, or reformation, or rehabilitation, that's not redemption. It's not redemption. And to just focus on getting things better, or getting things good, or getting things right, that doesn't deal with the real issue. 
And I'll say this, though. Sometimes when the real issue is dealt with and there is redemption, why, is, aren't, why aren't the fruit or why isn't the good works coming right afterwards? Where are they at? And James 2 challenges us with faith without works is dead. And, and there's a, a great struggle on both sides of, of this um, uh, balance, if you, if you will, that we, uh, our goal of Christianity, though, is not, is not just to change life down here. I hope that everybody gets better. I hope that everybody gets over what is hindering or hurting them. But I know that that can happen from uh, having a child and change your perspective of things. That can happen from a new relationship. And something that just begins to motivate you or, or move you to uh, uh, alter some habits or some things. But when you get the Lord Jesus, you get all of it. And when you don't get the Lord Jesus, you don't get enough of it. Let me say that again. When you get the Lord Jesus, you get all of that. You have the purpose and you have the priority and you have the potential. When you don't get him, then it opens us up for what we look at and what we read about in Matthew 12, verse 43. I believe that the goals of Christianity are to be followers of Jesus. But you cannot follow Jesus until you first found Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. There can be people who follow a path of Jesus and do some good things that he would do. Uh, uh, cracks me up around midterms or any election when politicians all of a sudden can quote things about Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Well, Jesus fed the hungry. Well, Jesus visited the, uh, this one, and Jesus, uh, and, and it's amazing that um, people can uh, quote him. They're, they're even quoting that Jesus would be for abortion, of the most ridiculous claims I've ever heard of any body in politics ever, that Jesus would be for abortion. Unbelievable. But, you know, th- there's all kinds of, of uh, quoting that what would Jesus do. And, and uh, I'm telling you this, people can walk on some of the paths, but not be following the person. Christianity is to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and then following Him should bring about those things that all of us desire. The, the Great Commission, we call it, says to go and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them that believe, and then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've said unto you. It's not an opposite order. Don't teach everything He said, then baptize, and then get saved. That, that's the opposite order. And if it happens in that order, then Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, becomes a very likely uh, possibility. And I'm not uh, the judge of of what happens to people uh, and what's taken place in their life, but I do know that Matthew 12, and it's also repeated in Luke 11, is a reality in our day. And so look at the passage with me, with those thoughts in mind of rehabilitation or or of... um, uh, of some type of um, reform uh, in, in someone's life without the relationship of Jesus Christ. First of all, look at the description in verse 43. It says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. An unclean spirit is looking for rest? Boy, it's amazing that Jesus offers rest for those that are labor and uh, heavy laden. <clears throat> it's something that the Lord offers, but only a willing uh, human is wanting to get that kind of rest. The unclean spirit that's spoken of here is seen all throughout the New Testament. And some of the description of an unclean spirit is one that's possessed, one that's paralyzed, one that's uh, uh, in, intrigued or involved with the paranormal, or another, another passage, one that's plagued, as um, there would be people that came to Jesus, my daughter, my son, is oft cast in the fire, <clears throat> is, is uh, plagued with this unclean spirit. And they were amazed when Jesus commanded and the unclean spirits left out of people's uh, lives. But the description here of an unclean spirit goes right along with an unsaved soul. I was talking to a um, uh, family this week, and I've prayed for this uh, family's uh, grandchild uh, by name. And I, I just uh, know the situation, and he would just was burdened. The grandfather was very burdened with what was going on and, and was trying to um, figure out, was it, was it this cause, or was it that cause, or was it this upbringing, or that 
that um, um, association or that exposure and what, what caused this grandchild to have, in his words, just out of this world, out of mind uh, occurrences. And as I talked with him this week, he said, hey, my granddaughter got saved and everything has changed in her life. Everything has changed. I said, everything? Everything. Yeah. It's amazing the, the, the difference, <clears throat> what they were uh, experiencing and, and going through. And, and they said, all I can say is she got saved. And dad led her to the Lord. And now there's just a total different experience in that young person's life. Yeah. Well, the description of unclean spirit, and, and we may not uh, realize what we're dealing with, but the unclean spirit resides in an unsaved soul. That's where you find it. And you wonder, uh, some of the news, uh, I, I read of, uh, of ordeals this week in, in news um, advertisements that came on my phone. I'm thinking, what in the world? You hear things that happen, you're like, who does this? How would anyone live with that thought or or conceive such an activity or an action, and then you say, I know how. There's an unclean spirit that resides in an unsafe person. Now, you might be uh, familiar with your, your life, and I grew up uh, in, a, in a farmer's home and in a, a faithful church member's uh, uh, experience. My mom and dad were in church, and the only, uh, the only problem I had was a drug problem. They drug me to church, but they really didn't have to drag me because I liked to go when I was little and, and had a good time, and and so I think of being unsaved and think, well, I don't know if I was really possessed or had an unclean spirit. And maybe some experience because of morality and discipline and, and raising up uh, in, in, in uh, the culture of, of being honest and doing right. And, you know, unsaved people still like to tell the truth yeah. or like the truth to be told to them. Amen. Yeah, right. uh, just because someone's unsaved doesn't mean that they don't have any uh, conscience or morals at all. And we might just be used to people just not, just not having the, the total answer. But I want to remind you that an unsaved person is an open vessel for an unclean spirit to reside. The unsaved soul is harassed, held hostage, and worst of all, has the penalty of death hanging over them, which the unclean spirit is totally okay with, totally familiar and comfortable with. You find in verse number 43... This unclean spirit gone out, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. What would cause an unclean spirit to leave an unsaved body looking for rest? Why would, it, why would that ever happen? Why, why wouldn't he just stay with an unsaved person? What, what, what situation would ever bring about an unclean spirit wanting to leave an unsaved person's body without that person being saved? Go with me to Mark chapter 1. Let me show you something in Scripture. Mark chapter 1. We'll go back to Matthew 12 and just find this so interesting <clears throat> and wonder how many real life experiences people have had just of this very same thing. Mark chapter 1. Look at verse number 21. And they went into Capernaum, straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. I wonder what he was teaching in the synagogue. Any, anybody have a guess of what the Lord was teaching in the synagogue? I'm going to just tell you it was scripture. He was teaching scripture. He didn't have anything else, uh, and what he spoke was the word of God, because he is the word of God. But he went to the synagogue, and they read the scriptures. And in other places, the place where he read was in the book of Isaiah and so forth. So he went in there, he taught, verse 22, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. Isn't that something? When the Bible's read, it ought to have authority. It ought to be the final authority on whatever we think, or whatever we practice, or whatever we uh, be a part of. I'm not saying that you're always going to agree with it, but I'm saying we always ought to submit to it. Amen? Verse number 23. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. May, um, imagine that. Somebody in the synagogue where they're reading the scripture, and he cried out. Look at verse 24, saying, 
Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. You know what I find is that an unclean spirit seeks rest when it's around authoritative preaching of the Word of God. The unclean spirit don't like when, when things are coming in those ears of that unsaved person, that it's authority, that is uh, truth, that is what the scripture said. And uh, the, everyone in that synagogue was surprised the way Jesus was doing it. In other words, I wonder how long that unclean spirit sat just comfortably in the synagogue, not hearing that sin is wrong and wickedness uh, should be dealt with. Not hearing that uh, uh, the things that Jesus and, and, and the Messiah coming. Th- this, this unclean spirit got uncomfortable when Jesus walked in and began to preach with authority. Look, you can choose whatever you do in your life, but you cannot choose, uh, you, cannot, you cannot say it's okay with the Word of God what you're doing with your life. I, I can be off from the target, but I cannot change what the target is. The, the scripture is true no matter what, I'm, what circumstance I'm in. God needs the priority no matter what I'm dealing with. In, in Mark chapter 1, this unclean spirit said, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, <clears throat> the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and do what? Come out of him. So, I just wonder if from time to time a person might be around some preaching or around some scripture, around some things of God, and the unclean spirit says, I'm getting out of here. I don't want to be around this. Or maybe somebody, a friend or a relative, uh, gets the Lord in their life and becomes a little bolder and a little a little uh, brighter light and begins to share and show and to impress and, and, and push. And then that unclean spirit says, get out of here. We don't want to hear that. But here, the departure of this evil spirit seeking rest, I believe because of Scripture. And then go to Mark chapter 3, verse 22. I believe every unclean spirit has to leave when someone gets saved. I'm going to say amen to that. Look at Mark 3.22. The scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He, Jesus, hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. They've got to explain this away because evil spirits are leaving people, and it can't be that the Lord is Jesus' Messiah. It's got to be something else. So they claim that he must be in cahoots with the devil, and he's just getting unclean spirits to leave because he's got Beelzebub. Look at verse 23. He called unto him and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, <clears throat> that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wheresoever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said he hath an... <clears throat> in other words, the unclean spirit leaves when the Holy Spirit comes in. And that's an unforgivable sin when you blaspheme the Holy Ghost and, and ascribe it to something else. Because that's the, that, that is the fix for an unclean spirit. You need Jesus Christ to come in and totally change that situation. <clears throat> well, the departure, and back in Matthew 12, could be for multiple reasons. Maybe the unclean spirit got tired of the fellow and wanted to find another fellow. I don't, it doesn't tell us, but in Matthew 12, we see this description of an unclean spirit and then this, this departure out of a person. One way to get rid of an evil spirit is to get the Holy Spirit in, and that'll work every time. But I'm sure, because Jesus taught us this, that there are instances where someone can seem to get a fix or get that certain thing out of their life, but now they're in a different situation. Look at Matthew 12, verse 43. 
When the unclean spirit has gone out, and I, I showed you that he definitely would leave when scriptures preached authoritatively. He don't want to be around that. He walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he, this is the unclean spirit, look at his decision. The unclean spirit says, I will return into, and this is a really, really important point. Notice in verse 44, he says, I will return into where? My house. As I still have possession, I've just left it. I've still got the key, I'm just not there right now. He says, I will return and go into my house from whence I came out. <clears throat> There's probably a, a great difference when an unclean spirit leaves on his own accord or when he's kicked out from the Holy Spirit's accord. You follow me? Salvation is different than reform or rehabilitation. You know what's a popular term in our culture today? Rehab. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. It's short for rehabilitation. And the state has the, 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 the program for, for um, uh, all those uh, uh, criminal charges and things, but we've even got private companies, hey, you need to go to rehab. We need to rehabilitate you. Well, listen, there needs to be a kick out of the unclean spirit, not just a get out of the unclean spirit. I, I've heard this uh, uh, before that folks have helped with um, uh, some of these uh, disorders and, and um, hoarding, not to uh, step on everyone's toes at Bible Baptist Church, but, uh, and, and, and I've heard that they'll totally clean out somebody's living space only to find it re-hoarded in a matter of a little while. Or how many of you heard of the person who won the lottery and then is living without a house and without money in just a matter of a few months or a few years as well? Yeah. Give everything, but it didn't fix the situation. You can give a person good works and it doesn't fix their eternal destination. Yeah. Right. You, you can give them uh, all kinds of things, but until they get the answer for it, that's what really changes. And so, in this passage, look at the decision. I will return. It's still my house. And he says, well, from, whence, from whence I came out. And then look at his delight. My goodness, verse 44. The evil spirit comes back. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Wouldn't you like to leave your house and come back and find it empty, swept, and totally decorated like you would? Oh, can somebody say amen, right? Woo, what, a, what an amazing thing. Uh, we had our first house that we uh, were living up here in, in, in this area, Mechanicsburg, and uh, it had white carpet. And we went in to, to buy the house and we thought, oh, it's so beautiful, white carpet. That was B.C. before children. And then after uh, 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 one child and a, and a certain pot that the dirt always kept getting out of the potted plant. You remember those stories, old timers of Bible Baptist Church? Yeah, I wanted to discipline with it. My mom said, just get rid of the plant. Don't discipline that little grandchild. Get rid of the plant. I'm like, where was that parent when I was growing up, right? There were landmines all over the place when I was growing up. And there was no removing it. It was removing me, right? Well, we tease about that. But anyway, all that white carpet was just a burden. And it was not a blessing then. And, and uh uh, we were getting ready to, to go uh, have our second child and, and got some folks at church and bought some, some flooring at an auction. Can somebody say amen? And when my wife came home, the carpet was gone. There was some new flooring and she's like, what happened? It was like she, now she wasn't the unclean spirit, don't get me wrong. But when she came back, it was empty. It was, it was swept and it was garnished and it was like, yes, this is awesome. I'm going to leave and have kids more often. All this unclean spirit, can you imagine his delight when he comes back and all the wreck that he had caused? All the chaos that was his responsible, uh, responsibility for, and then that was cleaned up. And he's like, hey, hey, wow, now I can invite some friends over. Now this life is cleaned up. See, the unclean spirit didn't want to bring any other unclean spirits over when it was all messed up. He had it done just fine himself. But look at this. Verse number 44, he came, he find it empty, swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits, 
more wicked than himself. All the emptiness of just reformation, rehabilitation, restoration, recovery. All those words are what the world uses all the time. Can somebody say amen? And what do you find? 62% within 10 years return to the same place of being enslaved. Why? I can't diagnose every situation with a broad stroke. Because I know that when people get saved and they don't live right, God can have them go back for some discipline too. Amen? God has the right to uh, uh, let us go through whatever He wants, and we are saved. Well, boy, this passage speaks to the thought of the unclean spirit deciding to go back and delight when He gets back. And then now look at verse number 45. When He gets the seven other spirits more wicked than Himself... And they enter in, and what's the next phrase say in verse 45? And dwell there. That dwelling is like permanent residency. It's not just a visit. It's not just a period. It's we're dwelling. There's a song, dwelling in Beulah land. Dwelling, staying, making it a, a, a permanent place. The word dwell there shows me that now this uh, situation has become even more of a dire situation. Oh, it was dangerous before, now it's destruction from now on. We've kind of experienced some of those things. Well, this is just a short-term thing. Those are famous last words of uh, all of us. Well, this is just a phase that won't last. I'll be careful. Well, I'm going to get it fixed eventually. Really? Be careful, because if it's just empty, swept, and garnished, and there's not a new dwelling, verse 45 gives us the danger of now more dwellers on the opposite end of things. And it leads us to the disaster. <clears throat> the Bible says in verse 45, And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. And that phrase, wicked generation, connects us with other places in the passage. If you look at uh, verse 34 of the same chapter, Jesus said, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. See, Jesus said, we, we need to get the tree good, not just the fruit. Yeah. It's not just the result. I, I said this many times, but if the, if the goal is just to get money, there's a few banks around here, I sure know there's a lot of money there. Yeah. If that's the goal, I probably could go in and just say, hey, stick them up. I'm here to get money. If that's, if that's the end goal, that I need money, forget working for it. Let's just go one of these places and ask, and, and ask, demand it. But there's a process uh, to get to that end. And the process is way more important than the product at the very end. <clears throat> oh, you can, if, if, the, if all of it is is product, and that's what, that's what our world is, is uh, uh, peddling. We're not... We're not uh, promoting love in our world, we're promoting lust. Yes, that's right. Amen. Yeah. It's not, it's not a committed love that the world is wanting to push. No, no it's uncommitted lust yeah. that will leave longing and, and lacking of the love. Yeah. Oh, no, we're getting the end product. That's what the world offers. Yeah. Yeah. Not the right priority and the procedure to get to that point. Oh, before there's ever that a sensual lust, there ought to be a soul commitment to that person when you say, unto thee and thee only do I keep myself till death do us part. Amen. Amen. The world says, no, let's just, let's just get to the end here. Let's just get to the product. Try to be careful with the wording, but you all know what I'm talking about. The product of... of the Lord's business here is not just a reformed life down here. <clears throat> and I pray that every person who gets Christ is changed. Yeah. 
and has fruit and walks differently and acts differently, forgives more often, and, and is able to follow the Lord through hardship and endure through whatever tribulation, because that's really what happens when you follow Jesus. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 1. All these things we endure, <laughs> following the Lord. Well, the disaster here said it's even to this wicked generation that has good words without good tree, puts good fruit without good roots. Look at verse 39. He answered and said, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a, a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. I love it when I tell someone about somebody getting saved and a good old, I mean well-meaning, just hard, hard-hearted, hasn't led someone to the Lord in 15 years. Christian says, well, I really hope they mean it, preacher, and I really hope they change. I'm like... This is what I'm thinking. Have you led someone to the Lord lately? Because if you lead someone to the Lord, you know that not everybody that says the prayer, and I'm probably looking at the person who's guilty of something right there, and they're, they're not trusting. They're wanting a sign. They're wanting some seasoning instead of just letting the Lord do the work. Yeah. Now, look, I, I, I'm not an easy believism person, but I'll tell you it's easy to believe when you just accept the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord makes the change, not the soul winner, not the witnesser. And, and it just burns me up sometimes. Some hard-headed, hasn't gotten their knees and prayed for the lost in 30 years, want to say, well, I really hope they mean it. Yeah. Okay. I really hope you mean it. Because yeah. if you love people, you're just going to keep telling them and help and let them get the change from up here instead of just the change down here. Yeah. That was just a little pet peeve of mine. That really wasn't in the notes, okay? Look at this. The disaster, though, is the last state's worse than the first. The evil generation wanted a sign instead of just repenting at the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, In the day the men of Nineveh, in verse 41, shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. I like that old illustration. I'll just catch them, Lord, you clean them. Amen. I know I hate to clean fish anyway. I'd much rather catch them. But uh, uh, I'll just fish for men and you clean them. You do the work. Because if we do the work, I'll tell you that it'll need to be done again and 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 again. But when the Lord does the work, all of a sudden something just changes in a person. And you don't have to police them around. You don't have to per personally be their, uh, uh, their disciple or a discipliner. No, they want to learn. They want to grow. They want to go because there's something out and something new in. And if you don't have that, maybe you need Jesus instead of just Christianity. Maybe you need the, the Lord instead of just some laws of how to live right down here. Maybe you need the authority and the actual uh, Prince of Peace instead of just some uh, 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 laws and precepts that you're trying to live up to. I don't have to live up to anything because I never could anyway. But he made a change in my heart. The disaster is that the last state is worse than the first. In verses 40 through 43, they miss the Savior. He said, greater than Jonah is here, greater than Solomon is here. Why, how are you missing this relationship with Jesus Christ? Go with me to 2 Peter chapter number 2 and I'll be finished. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter number two. What do I do with this preacher? I mean, I believe I got saved, so what, what are you telling me? I'm telling you to make sure that you focus on that relationship and the real fruit will flow from that. I, I love harvest season. I love driving down the highway and seeing a John Deere or an international combine in the field. I even won't even complain if you see a yellow lexicon or a, a caterpillar. I, I, it just gets me thrilled watching the dust fly and the beans go in and the semis sitting by the road. And, and you know, when there's a tractor coming down the road in the harvest season, I'm like, I don't care if I'm going 25 miles an hour. I love it. I'll just, I'll just watch it happen. But you know, before they ever get to that part, there was a lot of seed sown. 
some fields, a lot of seed was re-sown because the water and, and flooded and they had to replant. There's a lot of fertilizer put on. There's a lot of rain that came down, a lot of the sun that shone on. There's a whole lot of, of weeding and de -weeding. All those things take place before you get to that wonderful picture of a John Deere. Amen. Is that S970 running through there with duels on the... Oh, 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 oh! You know what happens before people get committed to ministries? People get convicted of missteps and sin. There's some seed that was sown of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was some word of God that took root. And then there was some realization that they want to grow and they want to go do something for God. Not for something else or not for some goal. They want to do something for God. And then, at the end of that process, there's a beautiful picture of a harvest happening. A harvest of, of good works a harvest of good fruit, a harvest of, uh, of just realizing. And I, I want to make it happen for everyone, but I can't make any of it happen for anyone. Or out with the unclean spirit, in comes seven more. Out with this bad act, and in comes ten more bad ones. No, there needs to be a, a redemptive, reborn receiving of the Lord Jesus Christ in someone's life. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 19, talking about false prophets, false teachers. <clears throat> they use great swelling words in verse 18. Verse 19, While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, oh, they, there's some knowledge of Him. Oh, we escaped the, the pollution, but the evil spirit left. Verse number 20 says, They are again entangled there and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. How can it be worse if someone had Jesus? It's never worse if you have Jesus. It's always better. This is an example of someone who has some knowledge and no Jesus. In other words, the evil spirit probably left because there was some, some realization of what, what the teachings of the Lord are. Verse number 22, But it's happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. I raised pigs as a kid and as a teenager. That was my uh, uh, claim to fame on the farm, as I got to feed and water the hogs. Can somebody say amen? And my mom would not allow me to raise hogs in the summer because of all the flies and all the stench, and she cut me out of a lot of profit in my day, I'll tell you that much. But when it came fall and winter and early spring, I'd have 100 hogs across the street from our house, and, buddy, I'd feed them and then uh, water them. And, everyone, and then I would take a couple of them to the fair. And I could clean up a hog and wash him as, as, I mean, put some baby oil on his back, make him shine up really good and get him in the show arena. You know what he wants to do? Find a manure pile and lay in it. I'd have him all brushed off and just looking sharp. And he finds a, a wet spot and just and goes and roots in it. I'm like, what are you doing, dude? You just got washed. He goes, I'm a hog. That's what he says. I didn't change his identity by washing him on the outside. He's still looking for a place to find some relief from his flesh. Because if you know anything about hogs, they don't sweat. And so they need to be relieved from the outside in. They need to be fulfilled from the outside in. They're looking for satisfaction on what they can get from something else because they can't cool down from inside. A lot of people are looking for some satisfaction from without. They're looking for some joy on somebody else's grass. They're looking for something that's going to fulfill their life, not from the inside, but from the outside. You can get it all, you can gain it all, you can go after it all, and you're still a hog. It's 
not until you're reborn, redeemed, that you have a chance to be different. Old Second Peter is not describing someone who's lost salvation. No, it's describing someone who never had it. <clears throat> Matthew 12 is not describing someone who got saved and the evil spirit came and repossessed the house from the Lord. The Lord paid the full price. There's not going to be any foreclosure on the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> he owns you lock, stock, and barrel. And he moved in. That's what kicks out. And the old, old evil spirit don't have a key to the house when the Lord Jesus moves in. He changes the locks. Can you all say amen? amen? And it's locked from the inside out. Holy Spirit seals us. Satisfaction comes from the inside out, not the outside in. What possession do you need to have to make you happy, Christian? You're not going to find it. And if you could, that should tell you something wrong with you, not right with you. No one said amen on that one. Boy. We struggle because a lot of us really aren't saved. We're walking a path of Christianity without the person of Christ. I'm not the judge. I definitely am not the jury. I don't even want to be the, the plaintiff. I just want to be the witness. But in Matthew chapter 12 and in 2 Peter chapter 2, there's a great warning of hogs and dogs that never got changed. <coughs> of unsaved people who never got saved. Of an unclean spirit that just left for a little while and came back delighted to find everything much cleaner and easier to defile than ever before. Well, preacher, are you saying that if I've got defiled with something that I really wasn't saved? No, I'm not saying that. No, I'm not saying that. Did you receive discipline when, since you got saved? Are you still seeking for peace because you're not finding it from within since you got saved? That's a great indication. I don't know why I'm just not fulfilled. Why, what's wrong? Maybe you're focusing on the outside instead of on the in. 2 Peter chapter 2, it had been better for them to have, to have not have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Oh, one of the dangers about preaching the gospel to people is if they don't get it. When they don't get it, it puts them in a very precarious situation that they've said no, they've said not yet, they've said I'm not ready and oh, friend, if you've said those words about receiving or submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're in a dangerous situation because now you know. Now it's up here. Now there's a real, a real opportunity for you to receive him. And no, I don't think I want to do that. Whew. The dangers of reformation and rehabilitation without redemption and rebirth. Oh, if you're saved today, aren't you glad that he came in and made a difference? Amen. Make sure you've got that experience. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father in heaven, thank you for the words. I pray that the preaching of it did not lessen it, but would only uh, enhance it, expound, exhort it. And God, I do pray that you would watch over us as we come to these decisions, Lord, help us to preach Jesus and Him crucified as the answer for people's life. Not the ten-step course, not the, uh, the rehabilitation process, no, the rebirth instantaneous event. Father, thank you for Jesus and what He did. I pray that we wouldn't miss Him this morning. Lord, we'd exalt Him and count on the power of God and His salvation, which is through the gospel. As the piano begins to play, if you're here this morning as a preacher, I don't know if I'm really saved. I don't remember just, just getting Jesus. I, I just need that relationship with Him. Friend, it's so simple. You've got to come to the end of yourself so that He can come in and be everything to you. 
Every head bowed, every eye closed. Preacher, pray for me. Somebody slip up your hand. I'm not sure I'm saved. Preacher, pray for me. Pray for me. My head's bowed. My eyes are closed. Maybe you've had a struggle recently. Maybe there's some things you're dealing with. Are you looking for the answer on the outside or from within? If the Holy Spirit's already inside, look for that answer inside. Look for the answer inside, not outside. You'll never be satisfied with what goes on the outside. You've got to get it from the inside. Lord, I pray you'd bless your people. Help us to, to own that truth and to find it on the end. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. Coming the day, Jesus is calling.